it is that time again for another episode of Brown Bagging It. And we have a wonderful episode for you today. So let's get jumping right in and talk to my cohorts. <laughs> hey guys, how you doing today? Did you bring your lunch bag? Fantastic. You know I never go without it. <laughs> okay, now I like Christine's. It's a little sparkly. Now does that make up for the fact that you were on vacation last week? <laughs> <laughs> it's my pants in the lunch bag. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Whereas mine is the exact same lunch bag I have been using since high school. You can see it's still a little, uh, a little tattered, a little wrinkled, but it still serves a purpose. <laughs> it's fresh food, Marty. Not the same old. <laughs> <laughs> well, guys, we're a little bit limited for time because of our guest today. So, Marty, I'm going to ask you to introduce Frank right away so we can get this thing going. All right. Sounds good. First off, I wanted to say that my brown bag, if you take a look at it, is empty. All right. I am broke. I have nothing left. To me. <laughs> I really said we've got to get a financial guy on here who can help me. All right. Because I spent my last few dollars on a brand new black shirt. I have nothing to eat. <laughs> so my good friend Frank Franiac here has been in the futures brokerage industry since like 74. All right. And I'm looking through this whole stuff. Most of the, the businesses you've run, Frank, I don't even understand the names of them. OK, but uh, you've been touching money, helping businesses grow their uh, their businesses. Uh, funds uh, funds to funds manager. Uh, I especially like the fact that you grew your business from 10 to over 40 employees. And uh, you've helped 150 funds with an aggregated value of over $10 billion. Frank, if anyone out there can buy me a lunch, it's you. <laughs> <All right>. <laughs> <laughs> well, it wouldn't be the first time, Marty. That's true. <laughs> Well, guys, I hope you can dive in and learn something new because our audience wants to hear. So let's start some questions. How about it? Awesome. So, so Frank, tell me uh, a little bit about just kind of a financial 101. What is it that you do? Uh, what is it that I do? Well, uh, in my most current business, what we did is basically we helped people who were trustees and okay. small trust companies to do um, administer their business and do the accounting for their business. Um, in a lot of cases, especially with small trustees, they are not um, they are not experts in those areas. They're experts in other areas. They need to outsource certain functions, and so we would um, do their accounting and we would do you know handle administrative tasks for them. Sorry, I'm a little off screen here. <laughs> CJ will find you. You move around the room. He'll find you. Okay. So essentially, we would, um, you know, let's say that, that you have a skill in, in, say, advertising, okay, and you're good at yeah. putting together advertising copy, that sort of thing. But there's other aspects of your business that you need to take care of, like accounting, for example, and maybe legal issues, things like that. So you would outsource those other functions to someone else. And essentially, that's what investment managers did with us. They outsourced functions that they couldn't handle to, to my company. So. All right, so that's awesome. So basically what people are doing is they're finding strengths in other people. That's our that's kind of our theme for today's show is how you find strengths in other people. So they find you because that's an area they need they need to find that strength in, correct? Yeah, actually it's a it's a great metaphor for that. You know, if you're an owner of a business, you need to know what you're good at and what you're not so good at and hopefully admit to yourself what you're not good at and right. find someone who, who is good at those roles, those functions to, to fulfill them. Did you find that in moving, growing your company from 10 to 40 people, finding the right people must have been tricky. And once you got those people, like moving them into the right spaces, do you have stories around that? Uh, yeah, actually I do. And actually it was worse than that. I, we, I like my most recent company, we started like four people. Okay. And wow. grew to like, grew to over 40. And yes, it was, it was very challenging. Um, Finding employees, in my experience, is always a crapshoot. You never really know what you're getting until after they go to work for you. And um, when I launched my my business back in 2000, um, it was very small. Um, I had an, a one individual who I had hired to do certain parts of the work who was awful. So we fired her after about oh, a month, and I spent the next four or five months doing the work myself. Um, 
which, you know, I know my strengths and my weaknesses and my strength is not doing administrative type things. So following that, I must have interviewed, I think I interviewed at least 30 different people uh, before I finally found someone to hire. And um, it was interesting because it was a Korean lady her, who had some challenges with English. Um, but there was something about her that it just told me, I, I thought she would be excellent, you know, for the, uh, for the position. Um, we ended up hiring her and um, she ended up being fabulous and grew to the point where she became a vice president and even a part owner of the company eventually. Wow. So, um, wow. Yeah. It was probably the best hire I ever made in my life. So, so Frank, do you have any questions when you're looking for people? Do you have any quest specific questions to dig out that strength when you're interviewing somebody? Or do you just kind of feel it out? Well, okay, first of all, I tend to be very intuitive in general. So for me, a lot of it is feeling things out. But it's, it's interesting you bring that up, Marty, because uh, once we got to the point where we got um, larger, um, when we were hiring new employees, I would never speak with them until everybody else had interviewed them. So if they came to me, it means that everybody in the company wanted to hire the person. And so I did a completely different type of interview. I, I think it sort of freaked some people out. But basically, I just wanted to get to know them. And I would talk to them about all sorts of things. You know, what were their hobbies? What kind of books did they read? What, you know, what did they do when they were a kid? All that sort of thing. Just to try and learn about them. And it was interesting how those kinds of questions would elicit a lot of information that told you a lot about people and what their strengths were and maybe what their potential strengths were. Um, which I think is another, you know, important thing to talk about for, you know, maybe the people that are watching this. Um, I think it's important not just what somebody can do for you now today, but seeing like what is their potential um, down the line. Sure. And, and again, that was something that's it's kind of part of my nature to see people in their, you know, whatever their best self is, you know, their best potential self is. And you need to kind of look for that and then nurture that. And I think that's what's very often missing in business today is um, you know, not nurturing people so that they can grow to, to, you know, to where you want them to be. Right. So as you're right. growing your business into being what it's being, you're talking about talking to people about their hobbies or what they like when you're bringing them in. Did that ever make you reshape some of the philosophy or the culture in your business as you're moving along? No. Um, my, uh, I've been in business a long time. Um, I've started quite a few companies and, and built them and sold them. And, and so my philosophy is, is pretty simple. Um, it sounds simple. It's not always simple to do. And that is basically provide the most value you can to your clients. So it doesn't mean you're necessarily the best at everything you do, but you give the best value for whatever it is, you know, whatever business you're in. And every decision we made, every person we hired, everything we did was based on delivering better value to the clients. And I always felt that that was the best way to make money. Don't worry about making money. Worry about keeping your clients happy and having clients that were going to go out and be your best salesman. And, and that is in fact, what happened to us. Uh, our business grew the way it did because of referrals, because we did very high quality work. And, and so that's my, that's my philosophy. A corollary to that, however, is take really good care of your employees. Um, you're not going to be able to keep your clients happy unless your employees are happy and engaged and, take pride in their work and, you know, that sort of thing. And so that's a very important piece of it as well. Well, that's, <laughs> this has been an eye opener for me already. And just to give everybody a little bit of a break, it's time for a humorous moment. I had once heard about the zoo on the verge of bankruptcy. One of their biggest attractions was their star gorilla but it had died. And the zoo didn't have enough money to buy a new gorilla. So the zookeeper took it upon himself to go to this young man who worked in the concession stand. He convinced him, look at this. He goes, Jimmy, Jimmy, look inside yourself. Find that inner beast inside you. There's more to you. There's more strength inside you than you know, Jimmy. And Jimmy was like, oh, do you really think so, Mr. Miller? What, what do you think I can do? And he goes, Jimmy, I want you to wear this gorilla suit. 
I want you to go out there and make the crowd roar with excitement. You can do it. I see the strength within you. Okay, uh, Mr. Miller, I'll try. And Jimmy put on this suit and he became something bigger than himself. He immediately became that gorilla. He shook on the bars. He swung from the trees. He beat on his chest and the crowd went crazy. But unfortunately, that fame and the excitement took the best of Jimmy. He climbed up the cage, started scaling across an I-beam that scaled over the lion's den. Well, Jimmy, with the crowd still cheering him on, was screaming and yelling and taunting at the lion. The lion was jumping up, gnarling his teeth, growling at Jimmy. Jimmy lost his balance and fell into the cage. It was at that moment that Jimmy realized he wasn't the gorilla. He started running with panic and with this lion chasing right after him. Jimmy lost control and started yelling, help me, help me. Okay, just then the lion pounced on him, took him to the ground, showing his teeth with such rage, leaned into Jimmy and said, shut up. Do you want to get us both fired? <laughs> I I did not see that one coming. <laughs> wow. <laughs> But, but but it's all about that inner strength, that inner beast, right, CJ? <laughs> you know what? You go for it, man, because you have me totally messed up now. <laughs> all right. So, so Frank, Frank, yep. there is so much more to you than just this side. I wanted to learn a little bit more about you because I love your philosophy. You are into uh, just that pursuit of happiness. You go out of your way to find other things that just bring you some joy. I know you do comedy, uh, improv comedy, and uh, you are a, a, a fairly uh, a fairly decent artist, okay? I mean, you've sold quite a bit, and you have your own style to this. So, so, so can you build upon that a little bit? Shocking, isn't it, Marty? <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, well, you know, it's interesting. I've always been a pretty creative person. Um, which surprises some people because I've been in the financial world all my life, but actually, whether it's finance or whatever, um, running a business is a very creative endeavor for a lot of people, at least it always was for me. Um, what happened with me with, with my most recent business is it got to a point where it was pretty much running on autopilot, and the only thing that I did that, that I enjoyed at all was solving problems, but not enough problems were coming up. so. Um, anyway, uh, a close friend of mine recommended that I consider uh, taking up painting, you know, art and painting. Um, I actually come from a family of artists, and um, I did. I started taking some painting classes and enjoyed that. Um, but then I ended up injuring my shoulder playing tennis, and I couldn't actually hold a brush up. So, um, but I could type on a computer, so I started doing digital art and kind of fell in love with that. And, you know, I've been doing that ever since, probably five or six years now. And yeah, as you say, I've been in some galleries, I've been in some art shows, uh, I sell online, that sort of thing. That's absolutely incredible. When, you know, I've, I've dabbled with painting. <laughs> I, I have a hard time calling myself an artist, although other people compliment my paintings. So when you're facing that kind of thing where, where you're developing something new, it doesn't feel like a strength at that point in our lives. What do you do to get yourself moving from feeling kind of almost like a um, a faker to become that person where you can reveal your strength as it grows and flourishes? Uh, interesting question. Um, I never really had a problem with that. Um, what I would have occasionally is maybe the equivalent of what you would call a writer's block or an artist's block. Sure. And when that occurs, what I find is I just put on some music I like, I sit in front of the canvas and I just start doing something, you know, it's like, it's like with writer's block, you know, you just start writing and then it starts to flow. It's the same thing I find with my art. Um, I just force myself to get in front of the canvas, put on some music I like and just put some paint down or or if I'm doing it digitally, which is more of what I do these days, um, you know, just start playing around and see what develops. And inevitably, something interesting usually comes out of it. Yeah. yeah. So, CJ, CJ, to touch on what you said, I think the easy part is calling yourself an artist. The hard part is getting <laughs> other people to say you're an artist. <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. You know, you, you hear so much about people that kind of just feel fake, you know, when they start yes. something new. 
I, I think there's a, a thing that happens as we're talking about building our strengths and finding strengths in others. You know, it's it's almost like a focus shift. You know, you were yeah. talking, Frank, about how intuitive you are when it comes to interviewing people. Do you just naturally see their strength or do you have to know what to look for in other people? Actually, I think I just kind of naturally see it. I mean, I'm a I'm a glass full kind of a person. And as I said, I'm a, I'm going to be very intuitive. So um, I really do tend to see people better than they see themselves. Uh -huh. um, you know, I've done a lot of coaching of, you know, youth sports in my time. And um, I think it was one of the be best strengths that I had was the ability to do that. And when you see someone that way, you can help them to see themselves that way. And that's how they grow. I mean, it's, I think it's the key to nurturing people and, you know, nurturing, you know, skills and abilities. What, what sports did you coach, Frank? I coached baseball, football, uh, basketball, and soccer. Okay, so all, all of those are perfect because you get these people who are excited about playing, but maybe they're not so good at one position, they're better at some, something else. So it's up to you to uh, motivate them, inspire them, and then put them in a position that they can do their best in, even though maybe that wasn't their first love. Um, it is, but it is, but you know, there's another thing that relates to that that you might find interesting, and that is that when I was playing sports when I was younger, I played a lot of volleyball also, and it, I observed that the teams that won weren't the teams necessarily with the best player, but the teams that didn't have the worst player. Okay. And so <laughs> one of the things that I, that I brought to my coaching was to, to take the kids on the bottom and work with them and try to improve them as much as possible, um, which is different from what you see a lot of times. A lot of times all the attention goes to like the star player. Um, and I find that that's true in business as well. Um, you want to try and, you know, not focus all your energy on the, on the superstars because you like them and you're happy with them and all that, but on the other people because that's how you lift the whole organization up um, you know, more effectively. Gotcha. My sure. Sure. Yeah, I think that's a very valid point. I I was in sales for a time and not what I would call my, my best time of life. I'm more of an artist type guy, even though I have issues being an artist. <laughs> but here's the thing. When it comes to business, it's really easy to find the strongest person and the weakest person. Yeah. There's a whole chunk of people in the middle that I think kind of needs our attention when we're managing. And I'm just curious as to what you might do when you have a lot of these middle grade people that have strengths and they might not know their best strength yet. You might have more insights than they do. And I know you just got done saying you like to, you know, kind of find the weakest link and, and work on that. But at some point, doesn't your team get to the level where you don't have a weak link and all you have to focus on is strengths? Um, good question. Um, yeah, I suppose. And I think we, we kind of did get to that point. Um, one, of the, one of the challenges is as the company grows, you get to a stage where if you're in a position that I was in, there's layers of people between you and you know, many of the employees, um, which makes it challenging because you don't want to go around your middle managers. That's not right. a good thing to do. Um, but I think it comes back to what I said before about taking care of your employees. If in general you create a good working environment, you pay people well and you, you care about them, not just as employees, but as people. Um, if you do all those things, that's kind of how you enhance your relationships with them and how you know, you help to put them and put the company in a position for them to, you know, to improve as much as possible. Yeah, that's, I, I like that. That's good. Yeah, I was going to no, say, CJ, you point, you were pointing out like the worst, you know, the worst player, the bottom line. It seemed like growing up, I was, every sports team I was ever on, they used to say we had the absolute worst player. And I looked around, I could never find the worst player. I don't know. Because all the other guys seem pretty good, so I don't know what they meant by that. <laughs> well, I you know I grew up in the in the model of I dabbled in everything. I mean, I touched everything, and then people would come up to me and say, you know, some people are the master of none, right? 
you know, you know that that phrase. Uh, what is it? The jack of all trades, but the master of none. Now, if you right. continue on with the, there's a couple more sentences there, and it turns out that to be a good story after all. But, <laughs> but the fact is, you know, when we're looking at someone else and we're trying to figure out how can I grow them, you know, if I'm a leader, I need to find a way to help grow them. You know, Frank, what would you do? Would would you suggest a certain path for leaders to? to inspire their people or is it up to them for self-motivation and you just have to set the environment? What are, you, what are your thoughts in that area? Well, okay, it's, I think it's hard to answer that question for this reason. Everybody's got their own personality. So, sure. you know, I have a certain approach to people in life and, and, um, um, and I think knowing Marty as I do, I think Marty's very similar, okay? Um, I like people, I like to be with them, I, I want to see them succeed there's a certain energy you project that it just comes across to people and they feel it. Okay. And I think more than anything else, it's like your mindset and you know, how that gets applied. Um, for other people, it might be different though. You know, I've worked with a lot of accountants in my day, and, you know, personality wise, they're very different in terms of how they approach, you know, work and life and people. And so, um, for someone like that it would probably be different, but I think the most important thing is to show a genuine interest in, whoever it is you're, you know, you're trying to work with and nurture. People feel that, and I think that goes a long way to helping them to grow. And, and I guess the last thing I would say is, I think the most important thing is to get people to believe in themselves. Um, it's just like, like what you just said, CJ. You, know, you wanna be an artist, and you think your stuff is pretty good, but you don't really feel like you are an artist, okay? Right, right. Um, to the extent that someone can help you to, to you know, to believe in yourself as an artist and to believe you can do it, you are a good artist and all that, that's probably all you need. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, I I hate to do this, but um, we have to shift gears here just a little bit. And Frank, we'd like you to stay on here for this next part. Uh, Marty's got a little uh, youth interview that he did, and I would love to hear your feedback from your perspective on this. Marty, go ahead and introduce that. All right, so uh, these are two young girls who are both are catchers for softball teams. And it was an enlightening experience for me to talk to them and learn how important that role is, that that role of catcher is so much more important than I realized. And these two girls are amazing. So let them speak for themselves. Uh, welcome to another episode of Youth Leadership on Brown Bagnet. Today I have two incredible young ladies, uh, Claire and Annabella. Uh, Claire, why don't you introduce yourself? Um, I'm Claire. I play for CTW Softball. I've been catching for four years and I like catching because I get t to be in charge of the whole field and I'm in charge of the pitcher and I'm in charge of the center fielder no matter what. Wow. And Annabella, what about you? Hi, I'm Annabella. Um, I play for the Ice 12 U. I've been catching for one year now and it's been really fun. My favorite part about catching is probably just being behind the plate and getting to do all that stuff. It's really fun and you just get to be part of the action. Awesome, awesome. So both of you are in a position where you can actually see the entire field. So it's kind of a leadership position. What, um, how do you inspire the other people? I try to make them like not think about what they have to do and give them stuff that's positive because if they start thinking negative they're never going to get anything done and if you kind of take their mind off of it it'll just be um muscle memory and they don't really have to think about everything uh, when i see my pitchers down or just any player i would call time i'd go up to my pitcher and i'd be like hey you're doing great you just need to take a few deep breaths, maybe do your zen, and you nice. can make those strikes go in there. You just need to know that you can do it. Do you actually tell them that you have to get into the, their zen? <laughs> maybe sometimes. All right, you know, awesome. You know, zen. <laughs> yes, I like that. What about finding uh, strengths within people? Have you been able to find uh, help people find their inner strength? You know, when your pitcher is doing bad, you're always going to try to, like, help them out, make sure they can find what's in them to do what needs to be done. So when your picture is doing bad, you just gotta be like, hey, come on, get those strikes and I know you can do it. And you just gotta either give them a hug, 
give them wow. a high five, maybe sometime to kiss them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me ask you, Claire, what about how do you communicate with well, the pitcher, and do you communicate with other players on the team? Yeah, well, you gotta like scream how many outs there are and everything, so everybody's still focused on the game and not on the puppy that's on the sidelines sure, or whatever. Sure. Wait, there's a puppy. There could okay, be, no, you know. That's you know. Right. And then like with my pitcher, I just kind of try to keep their mind off of stuff because okay. you know they're pushing through so much and they don't realize how much on is on them, and you just kind of gotta let them realize that they just got to play what they know what to do. Wow. So if you're in charge of keeping all the players like in focus, how do you stay focused on the game? To keep yourself going as a catcher, you motivate others, but while motivating others, you kind of are motivating yourself too. Okay. Because usually I don't really think about that. I just kind of do my best and go out there. But if I notice one of my pictures is doing bad, I will go there and I will get them in there. And sometimes I say stuff to make them motivated and me too. So it can really depend on how you say things to make yourself and the picture motivated. Awesome. You two are amazing. There's plenty of kids out there that don't play softball. They don't play musical instruments. They don't do anything. Uh, and they just are lacking that motivation. So what would you say if you had an opportunity to talk to other kids? Like, I don't know who you are, <laughs> but I know that there's... Um, a good person in there that always has been and there's always going to be one. You just need to be there for your good person. you got to do it. And I know this does not make sense. I honestly don't It's working know for I'm me. Saying. It's working for me. You're motivating me. <laughs> you are a strong, independent girl or boy and you can do anything you put your mind to. You just got to believe in yourself. Awesome. All right, Claire, can you top that? I don't think I can. Um... <laughs> I'd say just get out of the mindset if you're like down on yourself and you really have so much to give and you just got to give it all all the time. On behalf of the Brown Bagging team, I want to thank you so much. I've been inspired by the two of you and uh, I hope everyone who's been watching has been inspired by the two of you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much. There you go. And thank you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh. The those humorous just, moments. What? Oh yeah, yeah. Those just um, amazing young girls. Just I, I, I have the dream job now. I get to talk to these kids that just do amazing things. So that's uh, true. Frank, you got any advice for these two young girls? Well, first of all, let me say I love that interview. Number one. Number two. Um, baseball was the sport I played the most. I played until I was in my mid fifties, and and I actually was a catcher um, for much of the time, which. And so I can tell you everything they said is right on the money. I'm amazed at, at how um, intelligent they are about the whole thing yeah. at the young age. So um, I would agree with almost everything, although I've never brought up like Zen to a pitcher. That's true. <laughs> that, whole, that whole Zen. Remember that. <laughs> but but um, very often, uh, it, that really is what it is. You need to go out there. The pitcher is not doing well and he's feeling down and you need to prop him up and hope he can make a couple pitches to get you out of the inning. So, uh, great interview. I, I, I liked it. That's well, I'd have to correct you, though, because they corrected me over and over. It's not baseball. They play softball. Okay? <laughs> they corrected me at least a dozen times during the interview. And, and by the way, Marty, focus when you're catching, focusing is definitely not a problem. You are so occupied every second that there's no sure. way to not be focused. Yeah. Because the fastball's coming right at you if you're not. <laughs> hey, Frank, I know you have to get on a call right now, uh, but thank you so much for being on this show with us and participating. Uh, we really appreciate it. And maybe we can get you back here again someday. I, I would love to. Thank, thanks to all of you. I appreciate it. Yeah, have a thank great you, day. Frank. Thanks. See you soon. Right, Bye-bye. Bye, Christine. Well, guys, what a great interview. But we're not done. <laughs> There's more? Yes. Christine, even though she was on vacation, she did prepare the finally the uh, the the book that she was working on for the book review. She has a little final thought on that particular book. Are you guys ready for it? <laughs> Let's do it. Hello, Brown Bagginers. Welcome back 
to another week discussing the book Go Put Your Strengths to Work by Marcus Buckingham. The strengths movement as a reminder is this concept of focusing more on your strengths instead of trying to even out and get better in your weakness areas, go and work and focus on the strength in your strength areas. And those first two steps that we discussed last week were bust the myths and get clear on exactly what your strengths were. And from that, you were supposed to come out with these three strength statements that were really super specific about where you felt best what your strengths were in your work. So then the next steps is to free your strengths, four is to stop your weaknesses, then speak up and build strong habits to finish out the six steps of the program. And when you are freeing up your strengths, Marcus Buckingham, explains using a strong week plan. The strong week plan is just this, you know, using a week to really try to put one to two of your strengths into work. And at the beginning of the week, you need to think about it. Like, how am I actually going to do this in my job? And maybe that means that instead of calling your clients, if you have a client list that is sorted by the revenue that they're bringing in and you're always focusing on the bottom part maybe you want to go to the stronger clients and then help make them even stronger that might be one way that you focus on your strengths depending on what your strengths were listed before so you're going to create this weak plan of focusing on the strengths and then Uh, he talks about the free interview and the free interview another acronym and the free stands for focus R is release E is educate and the other E is expand so you are going to find tasks where you can focus your strengths you're going to look at your work schedule and release things that do not allow you to focus on your strengths educate yourself in the area of your strengths there's some more information that you can get and then really try to expand how you are using your strengths in your job well then the next step is kind of just the opposite is stop your weaknesses going back to those that you had created in step two of the book chapter two you also identified your weaknesses and now you're going to try to carve them out and he gives you a way to do that and essentially you kind of do go back to sign going through those and comparing you know is this an area that i have a strong instinct their growth or needs in it then i'm gonna try to trim out these weaknesses now you've expanded where you're using your strengths you've tried to minimize where you're using your weaknesses and then in the next chapter you're going to speak up about it and that is is talking about creating a strong team almost you're going to take this and you're going to find go through some conversations about how you can discuss your strengths up a level to whoever you're reporting to and then you're going to turn it right back around and to the people that are reporting to you or that you are working with you're going to have discussions with them so that you can focus them to be working on their strengths And then finally, you know, you want this to last. And so that means going through this program over and over regularly, you are going to review your strengths and review your weaknesses and confirm that you are using them. And even on an annual basis, going back and reconfirming that you have identified your latest strengths, maybe they change over time. Uh, So that is the Go Put Your Strengths to Work by Marcus Buckingham. Definitely gave us some great ideas and tips here. And I look forward to connecting with you on our next book and brown bagging it. Yay! Good job, Christine. (laughs) Loved it. Loved it. Well, it's kind of interesting because in this interview, we were talking about maybe not focusing on weaker areas so it was a little counterintuitive i really felt like the difference there had to do with the implied definition of the word strength yeah you know so in marcus buckingham's book strengths were very very specific things i think the example used in his book 
was um, this woman, Heidi, had identified that she was good working with the successful clients, helping them identify even more ways to generate revenue. So that was very specifically her strength. So I think that's how it kind of differentiates when we mentioned it in the... I think I think it's important to realize it's important to realize you can't identify strengths without first identifying weakness by comparison. I mean, I learned that from my yoga instructor Annabella, <laughs> who teaches me the Zen of softball. Okay, so I <laughs> there's that balance between strengths and weaknesses. Oh man, you know, someday I have to get used to your humor. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you're going to. Uh, maybe not. <laughs> Uh, but but here's the thing. Uh, first of all, I'm glad that you do lighten up things because it's always needed. Sometimes we get too serious. And when we're looking at our own strengths, you know, some of us think, okay, am I inflating myself beyond what it is? Or am I paying attention to what other people are saying my strengths are? Because sometimes people see strengths in us that we don't necessarily see. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What do For you guys sure. think about that? Uh-oh wholeheartedly 100%. Uh, I got yeah I've got a little short story just re- I'll make it really quick when uh, I was younger and I had this job as a salesperson I was selling subscriptions for a newspaper and I remember they uh, we had a contest between uh, they divided the sales room in half and they had picked the top two salespeople to uh, be on one team and they picked me and asked me to be the captain of the other team well I was petrified I looked at these two and I was like they're the top two salespeople I can't compete. There's no way we're going to win. And it was at that moment the sales manager came to me and said, have you ever looked at the the sales numbers? And it was the first time I realized that my sales were extremely high. I just, and I'm not saying it egotistically, but I was the top salesperson. I was better than these other two, but I didn't realize it. And it it took him, that sales manager, to point that out to me about something that I did very well. Because as you know, CJ, in sales, you hear a lot more no's than you hear yeses. And so <laughs> yes, all the no's start to weigh down on you. And before you know it, you're like, oh, I'm not doing very good. Uh, so, yeah, it took that guy. That was a, a big, big turning point in my life when he pointed it out to me. I would add on to that just to say that uh, it's it's effective to know how people perceive you as a leader. And so my story is I'm 5'4", I'm, 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 I'm relatively small to most of the population and as a leader in the military that was like a having to realize like you know I'm hearing all these things there's all these generalizations and preconceived notions about how the person in charge is going to behave but then when you step back and you realize how the people around you are perceiving you it lets you lead more effectively from that point oh I like that yeah yeah I've my leadership was a little bit different because most of it was freelance based. Um, now I, I was in the Fortune 100 world for a time, uh, but f- I would say the majority of my life I've run a company, and as a result, you know, I would have maybe anywhere from one person to eight people on staff, and about 300 freelancers. And it's a different kind of leadership, but it's still the same thing where you have to draw out their strength. You have to find their strength and help them draw it out. And one of the things that uh, I always took as a wonderful compliment is when someone connected in a way with their own skill while working with me, and they would say something to the effect of, um, you know, wow, you've, you've drawn out more talent in me than I knew I had. Now, clearly, I didn't have to do anything. They just had to do it themselves. But the fact was, sometimes we do need to hear from other people sure. that we're doing well. Mm-hmm. Right. We all need that little nudge, that little boost now and then, without yeah. a doubt. Excellent. And speaking about boost, <laughs> not yeah. really. Boost is no. the wrong word. But anyway, okay. our time is up. <laughs> oh, so, so soon. So until next week, folks, I hope you uh, share Brown Bagging It with your friends and convince them to join us live next Tuesday at noon Central Time. Have a great day. Bye-bye.